glad that you're here. Um, Sometimes people come on a little bit late. If those are listening or if you join a little bit later, say hello when you do come on. You'll be able to see comments um, in the right-hand side, Olivia. Okay. So if anybody says anything, say hello. We'll share it. We'd love to chat. But I'd love for you to introduce yourself and kind of hear a little bit about how you got into this industry and what you do over at Boozman Group. And I'm excited to learn a lot about what I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so please. I loved it. So my name is Olivia Kulander, um, and I'm a biologist by training. Um, I got my master's up in Portland at Portland State. Um, so I love the geology and the human body and just kind of life generally. Biology is my passion. Um, and I'm the chief scientific officer for Bujum Group. So I sort of write all the articles there and help with um, product development, things like that, sort of based on science. We want to be a very science-based company. Um, you know, there is a lot of research on uh, cannabis, all forms of cannabis, and how much help it um, gives to people. And I love it. It's so cool. So Boozham Group is a cannabis group, right? Yeah, cannabis group. Don't know. We started out um, in early 2019 doing specifically hemp uh, and CBD things uh, because, you know, the medical had not started here yet. And then when medical started, we began doing that as well. So we have essentially um, where Bujum Med does the uh, medical cannabis yep. and uh, Bujum Life does CBD and hemp-based products. Okay. And are you guys a seed to shelf operation? Do you guys farm as well on your... Uh, we don't farm, but we have partners at farm. So we work with local hemp farmers um, towards getting those crops, and, but awesome. we don't do it ourselves. Okay, so what brought you into this industry? Being in science, what I mean, what was your aha moment or piqued your interest in cannabis compared to any other option out there? Well, I moved here from Oregon. Um, well, I'm actually from Moab originally, so, okay. uh, but I came back to Moab um, in 2015, 2016, end of 2015. Um, and so I came from a place where cannabis was recreationally legal and moved back here where it wasn't. Um, and so I work with my brother, my brother Dashiell Kulander is the CEO of Food Group. Yeah. Uh, his partner, Brittany King, is the COO. So uh, I moved back here after sort of being in Oregon and being in that culture a lot more. and uh, coming back to Utah, Moab originally, and then up to Huber. Um, it was an exciting thing to get into. And I'm, I really, you know, I love biology. I love figuring out how things work. I love all the different ways that, you know, life is connected. And this was sort of a way to pursue that. Okay, so give me some examples of how the biology or maybe what people don't understand about cannabis or haven't been talking about, about cannabis that may um, pique their interest or that may, uh, that we should be, I guess, focusing on, you know, and related to say what you're passionate about, about biology. All right, so I um, deal with a lot more of the sort of research and stuff on cannabinoids. Um, you know, I'm less on like the industrial hemp side of things in terms of fiber and um, building materials and all of that kind of stuff, which is super exciting and I think is amazing and equally as important. I think the world will see. Um, it's, yeah, it's just a different. We need both, right? We need to heal our, our bodies and we have this magical plant or this opportunity equally as much as fixing our pollution and I mean our earth and our, everything yeah. else around it, right? But they're definitely grown differently. I mean, and this is something that's been really, as I talk about hemp, um, people assume the high resin hemp plants that are growing, where the type of hemp that's fiber, grown for fiber, is a different stock. It's just grown differently, right? And so we're talking more today, and what you really do a lot of study and research on is the high resin cannabis, cannabinoids, right? Exactly. So when you're saying, when you say resin, you know, what we're talking about is the glands on the outside. So if you look at um, a bud of either like, you know, often, especially medical cannabis, uh, you'll notice they're really sort of frosty looking. Um, mm -hmm. And 
hemp also, if it's high CBD and if it's being bred for those um, cannabinoids, it'll be frosty as well. Um, and what you're looking at with those frosts are things called trichomes. Um, you've probably heard of those, but trichomes essentially look like little mushrooms with really long stalks. And those are growing on the outside um, of hemp and can or cannabis plants generally. Mm -hmm. um, and with those, so those are these little glands and the plant is making art inside those glands. That's what cannabinoids do and also terpenes are being made. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, essentially you are starting out with, you have, um, like the geranyl pyrophosphate is this one little molecule that the plant has inside it. And that gets turned into everything. All the cannabinoids, all the terpenes. Um, What's it called? Uh, What's it called? Geranyl pyrophosphate. <laughs> okay. This, this is what you were just briefly touching on before we got on the call, right? Right. Okay. I want to I wanna dive into this. I want to understand this because I think it's <laughs> fascinating. I think it's something that I didn't know. And I think a lot of people don't understand that... Mm -hmm. You know, different different types of cannabis plant affect us differently, and the way we process it affects us differently, right? Absolutely, absolutely. We're you know we all are individuals as humans and as plants, and so the plants have all their sort of individualized cannabinoid ratios, and we have our individualized ways that we respond to those ratios. So it's an incredibly complicated web of interactions there but it's pretty cool because it starts out with all the plants kind of start out the same they have these same basic molecules inside them in those um, trichomes and then depending on the genetics of the plant it's going to depend sort of what enzyme it has so that geranyl pyrophosphate gets changed into cbga you've heard of cbg i'm sure and cbga would be that acid form before it's activated um, and with that, so the geranyl pyrophosphate joins with, um, with olivatolic acid, and then those make CBGA. And so all plants are starting out with that CBGA, but then they, each genetic strain is gonna have different enzymes, and the different enzymes are what's gonna change that into THCA or CBDA, or uh, just leave it as CBG also. Okay. Um, and so essentially what has happened with cannabis and the medical cannabis side is, you know, for decades, people have been illegally breeding it and breeding it to have high THC levels to be as psychoactive as possible, right? So you're starting out with, in cannabis, you're always going to have the same sort of CBG, amount of CBGA in there. And so if you just hit it really hard with the enzyme, this THCA synthase that turns it into the THCA, you're going to have a much more psychoactive plant with high THC. But if instead your genetics have this CBDA synthase, it's going to turn it into CBDA and you're going to have much more of a hemp strain. So just that ratio of enzymes right there is what's going to determine whether you have, you know, hemp or medical cannabis, essentially. Um, so, and, and this is where there's a huge breakdown, I think, in, or this, this gap is that they really, when I talk to people, I hear a lot of people say, Oh, well, hemp is one thing and cannabis is something else. When exactly. really, exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's the same. I like it's to one. compare it to dogs yeah. um, because, you know, you have, you can have a Doberman Pinscher and a Shih Tzu, and they're the same species. They can breed. They still have, I don't even know what percentage of the same DNA, but almost all the same DNA. But you're breeding for maybe size or you're breeding for color or temperament. And so you get the same thing with people, you know, with um, with cannabis. It's essentially, it's all the same species. Well, it's all the cannabis that we tend to use is cannabis sativa. So that's what we tend to be using um, in the Western world right now. But um, so, it, and it's all interbreedable. And we have this whole sort of like ideas of like indica and sativa, which aren't, they're not real categories, you know, they're just trying to explain this is going to make you feel like this, or this is going to make you feel like that which is really coming from the terpenes within them. So the terpenes are being made in those same uh, trichomes, and they're starting out with that same uh, ger geranyl pyrophosphate, but then they have different acids that are mixing in with them, and you're getting terpenes out of there. So, Okay, so 
what's the difference? I've heard this a lot, right? The indica and sativa, and mm -hmm. that sativa is used to describe that it's an upper, or it's lifting you up, where indica is more of a downer. Um, I've also heard other people say that that back when they first started consuming compared to today, um, there really isn't a lot of difference between an indica and a sativa in the way things are made feel anymore. It's very hard. I mean, how 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 do you really de define an indica versus a sativa anymore? Um, well, not even anymore. You know, the thing is, is that that was so. There was a, there is a species in species right. difference, but not in what we use. What we call indica right. is cannabis sativa, right? So, right. and that was from like way back when Linnaeus and you know all these fathers of sort of modern taxonomy and biology and stuff. We're getting these samples from Afghanistan and India and calling them different things. Right. But really what has kind of come to America and pretty much anywhere that's breeding for um, medical or hemp is just that cannabis sativa. So that one species. Um, now, essentially those terpenes that are in it are what is going to give it the different sort of, give people different reactions. So sort of something that you'll hear sometimes is when people will say like, oh, if it's indica, that means it's more than 50% myrcene, which is not exactly true, but myrcene is a terpene that for most people gives you that sort of indica feeling. So that's that sort of like couch lock kind of, you know, just a little bit of a body, uh, body buzz kind of relaxed. It'll give you that relaxed feeling. Sure. Um, and so, like strains that have high amounts of myrcene tend to be classified as indica or those that have uh, high amounts of limonene. So limonene is much more of an upper and supposed to kind of give you energy. Those are going to be classified more as uh, a sativa. But it's important to remember that everybody reacts completely differently. So, you know, that's kind of the majority of people when they get an indica or when they get something that's mostly myrcene, it's going to kind of give them that relaxed to the whereas but I mean but there are people who might take that and it'll have them bouncing off the walls so sure. it's important to kind of remember that you know we're all different and our biology is so different it's insane that we are we get these totally different effects from those but generally you have like most people respond to this chirping in this way this chirping in this way this chirping in this way and so we've actually we released um Bujum group has released uh, MCT drops, so they're sort of a tincture that you can use that are specific to different terpenes. And the idea with that is that people can try these and be like, you know, we have immersing, uh, immersing drops. So you could try those and be like, oh, this does totally like relax me. Mm -hmm. So that I know what immersing does to my body. Then I can look for strains that have high immersing if I, if I like immersing or avoid them if I don't like them. <laughs> What are some other terpenes that are commonly used or that you see or that are oftenly or often, oftenly, often uh, sought after, I guess? You know, what, 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 I don't understand the terpenes, but I, I may understand the way I like, the way I feel or like the way that I feel from a certain strain, right? What are some things that are some terpenes or some strains that are really popular right now for people and why? Uh, limonene and pinene are ones that are sort of uppers. So those are ones that you'll see, like anything that you see that is classified as a sativa will tend to have a lot of pinene or limonene in it. So those are things that traditionally kind of give people a little bit more energy. Um, pinene is associated kind of with focus. Uh, myrcene is one of the biggest ones. I think that, again, like that is kind of the one that's most strongly correlated with an indica. And so... People, you know, if you if you're looking for a, an indica sort of feeling, you're gonna want to probably try mercine. Um, and then they all they all also have very their own aromatic sort of profiles, right? And so terpenes are things. Um, terpenes have been around forever. I mean, they're the main components in essential oils, for example. So you have like lavender. You smell your lavender oil. That's gonna be like seventy percent linalool, which is right. a terpene that. Uh, associated with kind of soothing stress and anxiety and things like that. Um, and then the other cool thing with terpenes is like uh, 
they contribute to the entourage effect. So they're helping the cannabinoids once they get into your body. So limonene, for example, is one that is really helps with um, crossing barriers, whether that's skin barriers or mm -hmm. barriers in the body, uh, the blood brain barrier, things like that. So all of these terpenes essentially have a very distinctive smell, also very distinctive sort of therapeutic effects that um, they've been shown to help with, and then a very sort of a way of affecting your body in terms of how, you know, how the cannabinoids are affecting it. It's, it's awesome. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Humulene, we just came out with a humulene drops, and those it's kind of like everyone who tastes them says like, oh, they taste kind of like East Asian spices. So humulene is like uh, a terpene that's found largely in things like ginseng and ginkgo and that sort of stuff. Um, and so that's something that has been used sort of traditionally in East Asian medicine for centuries, you know, by just sort of the medicine is in the food, you can say, you know. So these uh, terpenes that have been used in food items for a long time that people don't even really like, aren't aware of what that molecule is in there that's helping them, it's often those terpenes. And then so those are also in cannabis and are helping the can cannabinoids to work on the body. Which is why it's really hard from my understanding to regulate or standardize uh, cannabis because each crop and e even from one corner of the field to the next, the terpene profile changes, is that? Absolutely. So how do you, where do terpenes come from? How many are there, you know, are, are most all of them in, you said they're from, you know, obviously ginseng, and I know orange, we've got a group here locally that it, that's extracting CBD from mm -hmm. orange. So um, limonene, limonene is one of the main ones that comes from orange peel. That's okay. Um, citral also is in a lot of citrus things. Uh, terpenes are essentially in almost all plants. Um, you have them, you know, cannabinoids have sort of, I'm sorry, cannabis has a set, you know, has about a, a hundred and 10 cannabinoids, 120 cannabinoids. It really depends on like where you're looking and what people are considering as cannabinoids. Um, but then terpenes, there's about, I, I think they're saying close to 200 now that you know, are identified and they're they're in everything. So wine, for example, when you drink wine, the different kinds of wine, you know, you're getting those flavors and everything from the terpenes. They're in all essential oils are almost all terpenes. And those, you know, when you think about where essential oils come from, they're coming from the extreme extracted from, you know, the plants themselves. And so almost all plants are making terpenes. That's awesome. So why cannabis? What, why, why should somebody consider cannabis? Like what? For example, my grandparents are still alive and I wholeheartedly believe they should be using cannabis using either CBD, topical, ingestibles, all forms of it um, mm -hmm. for lots of reasons, right? The more I learn about the endocannabinoid system, but give me your, you know, two cents. Why, why cannabis? Why should somebody be paying attention? Well, cannabis, I mean, it's arguably the oldest human form of agriculture. You know, they have shown that humans have been growing cannabis for thousands and thousands of years been using it as medicine for thousands of years, um, textiles for thousands of years. You know, it is probably the plant that is most, um, has sort of co-evolved with humanity. You know, it is the plant that is most entwined in our history as a human species. And even like when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes down to cultural things, things like, you know, the first American flags were hemp and the, you know, several drafts of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were hemp, you know. It was illegal not to grow hemp at the beginning of the <laughs> colonial days here, you know. George Washington was a proponent, <laughs> and Thomas Jefferson, all the people. So coming from, like, a cultural point of view, it is very, you know, it is, I, I think it's a very important plant to humanity. Mm -hmm. um, coming from a more scientific point of view, I think it's really, you know, cannabis has gotten about bad rap over the years, essentially since 1937, um, when it was pretty much outlawed. It was a tax that they put on it that effectively outlawed it. Um, but, yes. so, you know, we've had all of these herd scare, 
tactics for the last hundred years or so. Yeah. And the thing is, is that's all coming down to just one molecule and one effect that it's having. So that's just THC when it crosses the blood brain barrier and it, you know, sets off your, the neurons essentially, right? It's connecting to that CB1 receptor and giving you psychoactive effects. But the thing is, is that there are so many other molecules in, in hemp and so many other cannabinoids like CBD and CBG and all of these other ones um, that it's really sort of, you know, it's interesting. It's something that we, we don't really understand why, but essentially that this plant can pack our endocannabinoid system. So we have a system in our body that wasn't discovered until like the 90s. I mean, this is, a, it, it's incredible. It's something like the digestive system or the nervous system, which you've heard of all of these things, right? But so many people haven't heard of the endocannabinoid system. And that's partly because of this stigma that's attached to cannabis. You know, the endocannabinoid system was only discovered because people were researching cannabis, because they were saying, look, the THC gives you this psychoactive effect. Why? So when they went in to look for that, they found uh, the receptors that it worked on in our body. So we have uh, endocannabinoid receptors. So endo means inside. Endocannabinoid is like the cannabinoids inside us, right? Versus other cannabinoids are phytocannabinoids, T-H-Y, you know, it's phyto, like plant. Um, so cannabinoids from plants are phytocannabinoids. So when they, and it's just essentially pure luck or some form of coevolution that these phytocannabinoids fit in the same, they're like locks and keys and they fit in the same locks in our body. Anyways, back to what I was saying. Once they, as, when they found the endocannabinoid system, they then found, so they found these receptors in our body and they then found the neurotransmitters that set those receptors off and enzymes that break them down. And they discovered this whole system within the animal body. And it's, you know, they find it's in all vertebrates, so it's in all, uh, you know, mammals, fish, birds, amphibians, reptiles, um, but not insects. Uh, but it, it goes back, they found it in sea squirts. So it's the 600 million year old system that we have, like one of the original systems throughout our evolution. And what that, what the endocannabinoid system is responsible for doing is essentially for keeping your body in homeostasis or balance. So mm -hmm. it's involved in things like immunity and pain and things like that. And it's essentially, it's the only system, it's the only neurotransmitters in your body that work backwards. So they go, there's a synapse, right? Where, the, where you have two neurons communicating with each other. And with endocannabinoids, they're going from sort of the receiving neuron, postsynaptic neuron, back to the presynaptic neuron. And so they can send signals backwards. And that's why this works for things like pain is okay. if you, you, your own natural endocannabinoids do it, but also, you know, other phytocannabinoids like CBD do it. So you take CBD and it can essentially send these messages that dampen the pain signal. And so really like when you're using things like CBD, it's not like you're using a pharmaceutical drug the same way you are with, you know, other drugs. Instead, it's just sort of hacking your body's own system to be like, look, this doesn't need to hurt so much. We're going to dampen down that pain signal right there a little bit. But look, you're like this stress signal is coming through really strong. We need to damp it down a little and like calm the anxiety and calm the stress. And so there's all of, you know, all these different cannabinoids and specifically CBD is one of the big ones and THC, which are going in and just sort of like, mitigating or magnifying the signals a little bit to keep our body in homeostasis balanced and happy and pain free so how come i have a lot of people that are either in pain or um getting ready to have surgery or are being prescribed opiates and if they take or consume or test positive for a thc or on a drug test then they are no longer being prescribed where is this hiccup in communication and understanding the difference in what the CBD or THC does, the, the cannabinoids do versus opioids? Like how come our physicians and in our medical field, there's this big gap for our patients when now we know about the endocannabinoid system? Um, honestly, I think it's a gap in research. And right now, you know, it's the fact is, 
research has been effectively halted in America for the last, you know, since 1937, the last 90 years or whatever, 80 years. But beyond that, I mean, and before that, like what research was going on, you know, <laughs> back in like at the last turn of the century, you know, there's the kind of research that has happened with opioids, say, it's just been zooming along. There's so much money in opioids. There's so much, um, there's so much tied into that, you know, and they've been allowed to research it for as long as we've been researching things. With c cannabis, there has been so little research, you know, it's been so tamped down on that, you know, a lot of people just kind of dismiss it outright because, because of the cultural stigma around it, essentially, because yeah. it's legal, because it's like, oh, you know, potheads and blah, 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 you know, reefer madness, whatever it is, you know, these cultural stigmas have come and they've stuck and it's made it really hard for people to do the research that is needed. And it is very much needed. Like, you know, we're, we're all coming into this and we're like, oh, this is amazing. This stuff is so cool. Look at what it's doing. Look at all of these. But the fact is like the research is not really there, you know? And yeah. like, for example, right now you hear all of this talk on like uh, Delta 8, Delta 8, right? There's been a whole sort of drama around Delta 8 THC. And it, the fact is Delta 8 THC has been tested <laughs> on eight people. Like there have there so the study that everybody always quotes is eight people, eight eight kids, um, like years ago, you know. So it's it's just the research isn't there, you know. There's so much um of the anecdotal evidence, and yes. all the research that has happened is very promising, and we are seeing these really amazing things in it, but it's just still so nascent that like the information isn't fully there. And then you know I think. Beyond that, you have the researchers, and then, and then you have, you know, the doctors who have to kind of wait until the research is done to then incorporate that into their practice. And then, as you said, beyond that is you have the legislators, and you have the people that are actually sort of controlling the laws towards this. And the thing is, is there has just been so much cultural stigma, and, you know, that research is starting to come through and speak for itself, but it's something that's going to happen slowly. Well, and I, there's a big difference in you know, approved medicine versus uh, seeing results, right? Mm -hmm. Just because we have, we're, we're giving our medication to a group of people or our, um, you know, formulas to a group of people and it's changing or it's working for them does not, it's not the same as a FDA approved, you know, result. And I think what I hear from people in positions just like yours is there are so many variables you know, like I said, even from the terpenes and the profiles changing from one corner of an acre to or of a lot to another or from, you know, one plant to the next and and the way that they're affected. Talk to me about how. Previously, I've I've understood that if I consume cannabis, it's pretty much all the same and there are no risks. I heard the other day somebody talking about risk and how it's affected affecting blood clot medicine you know, and other drugs. Um, what are some things, I mean, because that's not discussed. You know, you hear about this miracle plant and how great it is and how it, it'll save everybody and everybody should take it. But if I'm consuming other meds, it's also a drug. And so what does that interaction look like? And you know, what are some things that, yeah, again, we can- so it, I mean, it does, it, you know, there are some serious interactions. War warfarin, I think, is a big one that like anyone taking warfarin, um, is not going to want to be on cannabis or needs to, you know, work very closely with their doctor um, to talk about taking it. Is that a blood thinner? Um, What's worth? What is that? Sure, actually. Okay. Sure. That's okay. I was just curious. Medication that I think quite a few people are on. So. Okay. Um, but essentially, you know, you have a lot of, almost all drugs are being metabolized by the liver. Mm. And all drugs is there's a really interesting sort of interaction where drugs are essentially enzymes in the liver are what's breaking drugs down, right? So how many enzymes there are in the liver to break down any specific drug? And these are called CYP enzymes, CYP. So like CYP3A4 is a big cannabis affected one. But essentially you have PDE or THC might up or 
essentially might magnify or mitigate sort of the amount of enzymes that are in there. So then those are acting on other drugs. So if you have, say, THC, you're going in there and saying, oh, this is going to really sort of deplete the amount of CYP3A4 enzymes that you have. That means that that enzyme is going to be less able to metabolize you know, certain other drugs that are being metabolized by the liver. And so if you have fewer enzymes, the drug isn't going to be metabolized as quickly and it's going to last in your system for longer. It's going to circulate for longer and be stronger. <coughs> um, now, the thing is, is that, you know, it's not just a pharmaceutical thing either. You know, there's, I'm not sure which drugs there are, but certain drugs, like you're not supposed to eat grapefruit with them, you know, because grapefruit sort of um, controls the, the enzyme amounts for that, those drugs. I wish I remember which they were, but. Um, so essentially, you know, the, di the different cannabinoids like different um, foods also are going to affect the enzymes that are going to affect the other drugs. And I think, you know, I think it's very important if you are on medication to talk to, doc talk to your doctor um, and hopefully you have a doctor who, you know, is also a QMP or who can prescribe cannabis um, or at least can just talk to you about CBD and like, you know, about what that, how that might interact with your other drugs. Um, that said, it has a much, much higher therapeutic index. So the therapeutic index is sort of, you know, the, essentially the good that a drug can do versus, or the amount that is needed, that ratio to uh, how much is needed to be like, essentially to overdose on it. Um, and with a lot of drugs, you know, we're talking of a number that's like 40 to one or 70 to one or something like that. Um, Whereas with cannabis, I believe it's like 10,000 to one, like the, the chances of kind of like of overdosing or overusing it, it's much, much harder to do than with virtually any other pharmaceutical. I mean, this is much safer than even something like ibuprofen, but there are, you know, there, it does interact with other things in your body. And that yeah, is to, say, to say that there are no risks would be foolish, right? And to say that it could solve everything would be ridiculous also. I had another gentleman that came on to my show and we were talking about plastics and he said the same thing. And he was like, for me to sit here and say that hemp is a save all, fix all solution, it's not right now. I mean, there are things that we have to have certain drugs for. Modern medicine is an amazing thing, right? Oh, However, I think we've definitely missed the boat in in where we're headed by eliminating it and by not having it here to research. I mean, Israel is leaps and bounds ahead of us because of research alone. Restrictions are still very strict, but you know, because they've been able to study the science has been much, yeah, much better. Absolutely. And that's the thing is, I think that like, you know, not, we can't get ahead of, we don't want to jump our head of ourselves and say, oh, this is a miracle. It's not, you know, it's a plant. And it's just sort of another tool in our toolbox of, you know, keeping ourselves healthy as individuals and a species and all that sort of stuff. Can um, you help me, and maybe you already said this, can you help me understand the overdose? How come opioids or other drugs, is it because they attach to your receptors and build on each other and that's why you overdose where cannabis doesn't? Like, how it's a different kind of receptor. Okay. So um, opioids work on opioid receptors. They have very specific receptors. Um, with cannabinoids, they're working on endocannabinoid receptors. So there's all different kinds of receptors in your body and they're all doing different things, right? right. So opioids are very like, you know, clear in like regulating pain, for example. And whereas the endocannabinoid system is more about keeping your body in stasis. And okay. so they're just sort of, they'll have different aims there with what they're doing. Uh, and CBD, CBD actually, not THC, but CBD, um, they have found that it works on opioid receptors to some point, to some degree, um, not to the like point of getting addicted to them, but actually in helping people to transition off of opioids. Um, it's been shown to be very helpful in doing that. Uh, but yeah, okay. it's going to be a, a different receptor that does different things. So. I would say it's probably the biggest request that I hear is people either addicted to opioids or using opioids for pain management that want to bring that down. And it makes sense to me, like you said, um, in the beginning where the CBD is attaching and just kind of numbing down. I'm trying to get in my screen, use my hands to talk and I forget where I'm at. <laughs> just 
just kind of dumbs down that or mellows out that, you know, pain. Um, yeah. Well, it's really interesting. For example, so with THC, you know, people who use THC a lot. So the THC is essentially setting off the receptor CB1, CB1 receptor. Uh, but the more you use THC, the more your body is like, oh, I have plenty of this. Like, I don't, I, I don't need to work so hard to like, you know, bring this molecule in. So those CB1 receptors get desensitized. So they're not as easily set off the more, yeah. the more you um, consume THC. And then beyond that, the, once they've desensitized, if you're still sort of bombarding them, they're going to essentially retract and disintegrate. So you're going to have far fewer, um, receptors if you're using THC regularly. But the good news there is as soon as you stop, the body starts making them over again. But the THC is essentially analogous in our body to something called <coughs> anandamide. So anandamide is our an endocannabinoid. So it's something that our body makes itself. Ananda comes from the Sanskrit for bliss, the bliss molecule. And they say that's sort of one of the things involved in like a runner's eye. Um, there's also uh, it comes into play with like reproduction and birth and childbirth, things like that. But essentially it is the molecule that's kind of one of those kind of keeping you stable. So if you're doing, you know, taking THC regularly and then you stop, you're leaving your body without all of those receptors. You know, they've either desensitized or retracted and disintegrated. Um, so that's where you, you hear of like THC withdrawal and those sort of things like, you know, not being able to sleep or um, being a little bit more anxious than usual. And those things are because your body then doesn't have those natural receptors to use the anandamide that your body is naturally making. So those natural processes that your body should be taking care of are sort of like not getting what they need. But it, it rebuilds very quickly. So that's why you have, you know, if you take a tolerance break, if you're a medical cannabis user, then your body is essentially quickly rebuilding all of those receptors because it's like, oh no, we're now we're not getting this molecule that we need. Um, so this explains, I hear from people, you know, there's a small, I don't know if you want to call it withdrawal period, but where people are anxious or uncomfortable or antsy or, you know, don't sleep as well, but it's always only for just a couple of days. Yep. And then, and wow, I'm, yeah. so I, I just, it makes, Sense. Yes, I'm going to rewatch this and I'm going to reshare this because I'm learning more information. And yeah. So those, you know, those are the those are the um, the parts of sort of the human body that the endocannabinoid system is regulating. So things like that, sleep and your oh. sort of mood and stress level, things like that. So yeah, it just kind of throws that off of balance when you don't have the receptors there. Anymore. That's interesting. Well, it's. So what's your response then for people when you hear, um, you know, that cannabis solves everything or that they're, it's not addictive? You know, do you believe cannabis is addictive? What's, how do you address the addictive claim? Um, I think, you know, it's not addictive in the same way that opioids are addictive. Like it doesn't, it's not the same kind of addiction. Agreed. Um, it's more like a habit or, I mean, it's like, you know, a lot of the, when they would say, you know, you quit smoking, you put a straw in your mouth because it's the habit of having something there. I could see more than an actual physical or mental dependency on. Well, there, you know, there is that physical aspect of it. You know, and there is that getting antsy and not sleeping and stuff. But yeah. it's, you know, I think that just the mechanisms are very different there. And it's the same way, you know, if you're not getting the proper nutrition, you know, you're body is going to do kind of a similar thing, right? So, you know, I, I, I would never say that, like, it's, there's no dependence, you know, I think that you can form a dependence, but I do think that it is much more, you know, it's not as sort of physical as something like opioid. It's more kind of. I imagine I compare it to, to something like a vitamin. I take vitamin B on a regular basis and I notice a big difference when I don't. And I think, you know, it's the same thing for people with iron deficiencies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it really is. It's a, it's not a, if I, if I don't take it, I'm not throwing up sick, but I notice a much bigger difference, you know, when I'm not feeding my endocannabinoid system. Yeah. Where I'm not it, work, it works very similarly because, you know, again, like THC is just sort of standing in for that natural anandamide. 
but if you've been taking THC regularly, then your body isn't going to essentially have the receptors to get all the anandamide it needs, all those messages that it needs, um, until it grows those receptors. So instead of it being a dependence in terms of like, oh my God, I, I, I want, you know, I need THC so badly right now. It's more that your body's like, oh, I don't quite have enough anandamide right now. So I can't sleep and I'm stressed out, you know? Anxious and yeah, so fascinating. So then it grows back pretty quick. It's crazy. Well, so talk to me about um, Bujum Group real quick. Are you guys looking to expand? Are you growing right now uh, on the medical side or are you just processing on the medical side? Uh, we're processing on yeah, both sides, medical and CBD. Right. Um, and essentially right now, like, you know, business has been good. There's just, you know, not that many people processing in Utah right now, which is, yeah. you know, it gives us a great opportunity. Um, and we're really just trying to, you know, come up with new products that we think will work for people. Um, my, one of my favorite parts of the job is, you know, trying to figure out like, okay, what terpenes, you know, are right. going to be really useful for people and what cannabinoid ratios are going to help them the best. And so a lot of what I do is just sort of researching that kind of stuff and going through, you know, scientific studies and trying to figure out, okay, like what, what, what has been shown to actually work, you know, here. And, you know, right now our focus is really just on sort of giving people the best products that we can. And, you know, I'm, I'm not so much on the business side and I'm not sure where, where that is going. That's okay. But, you know, I'm, I'm deep in the weeds there with the, the, with the research and the products and sort of, it's just fun to kind of come out with new things and see that they're really helping people. We get a lot of really good feedback, which is really, really fun. And I think that's one of my favorite parts, you know, of the job. I got an email the other day of someone saying that they were going off opioids, opiates after one of our products and things like that. And so like, just like, you know, our, our focus is really right now just making the best things that we can because you know if we make effective products you know we'll keep buying them and exactly. especially yes. right now the world definitely needs a little more health and homeostasis well and it's opened the door for people to pay attention i think that you know we say earlier well what you know how do we bridge that gap i go back to how do we open people's minds to explore something different than what we've been taught you know my parents and and I, we we really haven't been affected by a lot of the things that are really causing the the biggest problems in the world, right? And and even down to you know dare I was taught and it was you know we were told this whole time that weed is a gateway drug and it's reefer madness and bad and and it took an entire globe to you know take it off the market and and ban it and so. It really is opening these eyes and or changing mindset to be able to explore different options. And I think COVID just a hundred percent. I mean, there's nothing nothing else like this. No. In in the world. Nothing that has like been for millennia so important to humanity and then just totally blackout banned <laughs> for 80 years, you know? Um <laughs> So many people we you know we've all been brainwashed by dare we all dare to keep kids off drugs we all have the rulers and the t-shirts and all that stuff you know? Bumper and, stickers. how many parents have the i've got a proud <laughs> graduate you know i've graduated from dare <laughs> proud supporter. i like it but i, I a bumper sticker <laughs> i'll find just one <laughs> i'm sure there's one on one of our high school vehicles somewhere probably <laughs> But, you know, I think, I think it's a long journey for most people. I think that, you know, it's hard, it's hard to just kind of do a, a mind switch, you know, and you don't want to just change your mind based on whatever's popular or whatever, you know, people are saying at the latest moment, you know, I think everybody should do their research and look into it. And for some people that might be like hearing from your friend that it worked and be like, oh man, I got to try this. Or it could be, you know, spending three years looking into, you know, reading articles and trying to figure out how this works and why, like, you shouldn't be afraid of it, but. Right, right. So we have, uh, we have um, some, I want to keep doing this and I want to chat because I want to talk, we didn't even dive into some research that you're interested in doing and looking at doing. 
but I want to give you props because I think really when we talk about business, you know, the care and the concern about patient and long-term, um, you know, returning clients and getting them what they want and what they need is really what drives this business. And there's been so much garbage that's been put out the, on the market or so much misinformation um, that I really have to, you know, give props back to you, Olivia, and to Bujum Group for what you guys are doing I love the idea that you are, or I love that you guys are doing terpene um, tinctures because I see this too. Cannabis has moved to such a high potency THC that if you're a new user, sometimes it's almost a slap in the face for people. And they're, they're scared to do it because it's so strong where I could see using terpenes would you know, really give you an opportunity to work your way in, find out what you actually like without I'm assuming spending as much money or having to, you know, I guess. Yeah, have to so, that, so. yeah, yeah, just a better, better opportunity that way. Um, yeah, we, the, we love, we love the terpenes. It's, it's sort of, it, it's a lot of fun just, you know, even on our, testing them on ourselves and seeing like, yeah. you know, I, I want to see how my body responds to uh, beta caryophylline. So I'm going to try this terpene and really sort of pay attention to what it's doing to my body. You know, in, in most strains of weed, even if you're doing like a single strain, like you're saying, you know, we're, oh, we're just doing do like Dutch treat haze, which, and, and again, all of our, all of our products are also single strain. So, you know, every product has a strain associated with where we got that, the cannabinoids from. Okay. Um, but, you know, any, a single strain is going to have 10, 15 different uh, terpenes in it, right? It's going to have tons of different terpenes. And because these are synergistic, you've probably heard of the entourage effect, I mentioned it earlier, but you know, the cannabinoids and terpenes. So every single one of those molecules is affecting every single other molecule. Like you have no idea what you're gonna get in a mixture like that. Whereas if you just take it out and, you know, take out mercine, I'm gonna try mercine and see what it does. Okay, I really like mercine. So I'm gonna look for strains from now on that are really high in mercine because I know that they affect my body well. Versus, you know, take, just uh, consuming a strain and then being like, well, I love that, but I don't know if it was the mercine or the beta caryophylline or the limonene or I don't, I don't know what gave me that feeling that I like so much. Or how to find it again. <laughs> I think that's another big piece. Um, well, I, we're going to cut early just a little bit because we've got our safety and regulations meeting here in just right. 10 minutes with the Global Associ Hemp Association. Um, so I would love to invite you back. I'd love to get together. We want to do a women's group. I saw April chime in a little bit earlier. I want to give her a shout out because I would love to get her involved. She's very passionate about the patients and the medical care and the women in the organization. And so I'd love to invite you to do something there also. And then... Um, we were talking about women in our group. We'd all we'd all love to come join you. I would love it. I want to do a cooking with cannabis night. Um, oh. or cooking with hemp. I ordered some substitute um, vegan meat. I don't know what you call it, vegan meat substitute from Hempway Foods, and it's amazing. So shout out to Carla at Hempway so Foods. Like a, like a vegetarian, like a vegan meat made out of hemp. Oh it's, it's third ingredient is hemp. Um, and she's, she's out of Colorado. I've interviewed her, but it's delightful and wonderful. And so I want to, yeah, again, just bring more hemp, you know, and more awareness about what's out there and I'm share. I'm super with excited about that. I'm, I'm vegetarian, almost vegan. So that's on super, I'm like, what? Okay. We can. Okay, so I ordered, I ordered more. And, and we, we also, we have a sort of food scientist working with us who is designing our, he's, made our uh, lozenges. I don't know if you've tried those, but um, okay. we're, we're trying to sort of branch out. I'm not food scientists, but I guess flavor. Yeah. Flavor pro. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, I don't know very much about it. Again, it's something else I'm learning. <laughs> People say, well, you know, hemp is in everything. Hemp and cannabis are in every aspect of our life. It's like technology. It's everywhere. I'm so more so, more and more. It's yes. Now that people are now that, now that we can grow it, it will grow. Exactly. Well, and speaking of, another thing that the Global Health Association is going to be doing is launching a design contest. Um, mm -hmm. And originally, when we were talking, we were in our textiles meeting. But of course, my mind went to architectural design and uh, Carla's went to you know, food. 
And so really with hemp, we can do absolutely anything, but a great way to educate and draw light and get people involved to design um, anything from car parts to clothes to houses and meals and dishes. So, so yeah. It's a fast growing thing, you know, right now the way, uh, yeah. It doesn't, it happens fast. I feel like I miss one meeting or one week in the association and I feel like I've missed an entire year in any other industry. It just is. And, and what's the most exciting? Yeah, is the brilliant minds that are behind it. So you yourself, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for doing all this. It's amazing. Love Absolutely. The Before we close off real quick, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, how do they reach you? Uh, you can email me at ok at boojumgroup.com or go to our website, boojumgroup.com, uh, and there's a contact us button there. That comes to me. Um, also, by the way, if you go to boojumgroup.com and go to the blogs, you can see sort of what, I, what I've written um, on cannabis, endocannabinoid system, all that sort of stuff. I just put, we just put one up yesterday that was on um, that was on sort of bioavailability and the different you know different ways you can consume cannabis and how much you get from that and what's actually happening in your body you know when you're eating it versus rubbing it on your skin versus putting it under your tongue. Can I share that? Can I share that article? Are you okay if I share that article? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would love to. I'd love to collaborate and share that. Well, then let's reach out. Let's do this again. Um, I'll send you an email. Um, let's yeah, set something up and stay in touch. Thank you so much for joining. I'm I'm fascinated with your your level of education and your ability. You did great presenting. So thank you. Hey, <laughs> thank you guys. Have a good day. Have a good one. See you later.